So well, welcome to the fifth uh, episode of Virtual Science Saturday and the first episode of the new year 2021. Uh, Dr. Kishore Kapale, Chair of the Department of Physics at WIU, who usually moderates these events, is attending a conference session right this minute, even though he's sitting right in the next room from me. So we are delighted to see you all here and you are interested and for your interest in these events. So few housekeeping things to begin with. Please mute yourselves to cause the least amount of disruption to the meeting. These meetings are recorded with the shared screen and the uh, speaker view. You will not be visible unless you say something. So uh, <clears throat> you are welcome to ask questions as they come up through the chat features on Zoom. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on these questions and ask them on your behalf to, the, to our presenter. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of hearing and seeing Dr. Jim Rapchik, who is a professor of physics and College of Arts and Sciences Assistant Dean at the Quad Cities campus. He will be showing you a pretty remarkable experiment that allows you to see the invisible or to be specific. It allows you to see subatomic particles. Thank you, Dr. Rapchak, for leading today's event. And the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Aparna. Uh, again, my name is Jim Rapchak. Today I have with me uh, uh, Jesse Caverly. He's a student, uh, a student in our uh, science teacher education program. Uh, and he came up to make sure that I am safe and careful in all the experiments that I do um, and, uh, and to assist in a number of ways, including, but uh, as in particular, he helped me to be safe by bringing up some goggles because I didn't have any uh, goggles to work with. Um, all right, so uh, today's, uh, event is focused around the an experimental technique for making something that was totally unexpected uh, and was totally invisible to our eyes uh, that makes it visible. And it's a technique that involves so many different areas of science. So the technique itself is really fascinating. There's lots of uh, things to think about and uh, and ask questions about. So I hope that you do. And I'm, I, Aparna, I didn't quite catch your, your statement, but is the idea that they'll type in their questions and then um, you'll, uh, you'll ask them? Uh, yes, uh, they, they can type or uh, we don't want too many people asking questions at the same time, just to avoid that. So, if right, they so I think the best thing to do is if, if you can type out your question and then uh, Aparna will stop us. There'll be plenty of places where we can stop for a moment and she can ask those questions as we go through the, the process. So mm -hmm. that, I think that's probably the best. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, science involved in this technique. So the basic idea is that we're going to create something called a cloud chamber. Um, and uh, it does exactly what it sounds like uh, it does, which is it creates an atmosphere in which clouds can easily form. The clouds that we're gonna be forming are not clouds that, are, uh, that we're used to seeing, rather they're clouds uh, of isopropyl alcohol, like so. Uh, this is a special isopropyl alcohol. So typically you would buy in the, um, when I was a kid, uh, you would buy isopropyl alcohol at about 70% by content uh, and the, other, the rest of it would be water. And that is no good for the experiment that we wanna do. But recently, because of safety concerns, actually environmental safety concerns, um, <clears throat> beauty shops stopped using acetone for cleaning and removing nail polish and things like that. And instead they have uh, begun using a much higher purity isopropyl alcohol. And this is 99%, at least it was when I bought it. Um, hopefully no water has gotten in. Uh, it's very difficult to get that 30% of water out of isopropyl alcohol. It really wants to hold on to it. 
uh, Jesse can probably explain that <laughs> to us in a bit. But the, uh, all I know is I'm so thankful that uh, beauty shops have switched to this because it made it much easier to buy this substance. Uh, we don't want water, and that's the key thing. So the, um, the isopropyl alcohol is going to form our clouds. Now to do that, um, actually what we're gonna form is first fog and then clouds. The fog we're gonna produce uh, will be a super saturated vapor of isopropyl alcohol in our tank environment. So our tank environment is here. This is a two gallon critter tank, it's called. Um, and it's just about the right size for what we wanna do. Uh, if you notice, <clears throat> in the tank, I have felt, black felt, which is adhered to the side of the tank using Velcro tape. But the top of the tank is clear. So this is a nice design. Uh, if you look on the web for designs for cloud chambers, you might see uh, cases where they'll put the felt at the top but then that means your viewing is restric restricted to the side. But in this case, um, with a small tank like this, I've got the top open for viewing. So we're gonna be able to look straight down into the chamber um, to see what we're looking for, okay? So we're gonna soak this felt with our, um, let's see. I wanna pin myself, how do I pin myself? I can't. I can't. All right, never mind. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to soak the felt with the isopropyl alcohol. Uh, be liberal. If you're thinking about doing something like this at home, uh, don't be afraid. Obviously, you don't want a, a, a gallon of isopropyl alcohol in here, but you definitely want this to be well soaked. Then we're going to seal the chamber. And I have uh, this. I took the liberty of creating, uh, taking some aluminum plate that we had available in the shop down in, in Macomb and used our little aluminum plate slicer uh, to create a size uh, plate that fits exactly over the tank. And then um, we painted one side of the aluminum with black to help make a contrast background to see what we we're intending to see. So the black is gonna be facing into the tank. So we'll have it upside down with the felt soaked by the, um, uh, the felt soaked by uh, in the isopropyl alcohol. We'll cover this and then very important, we're going to tape it uh, so that it makes a nice tight seal. And the reason why we wanna do that is that we do not want, as we um, modify the environment, as I'm gonna show you in a second, we don't want air uh, to go into the cooled environment um, because when it does, it carries a lot of moisture with it and then it'll disrupt the isopropyl alcohol fog that we're creating. Okay, so once we've done that, then we're gonna go ahead and turn the tank upside down. Well, right side, yeah, upside down. Um, <clears throat> and we're gonna place the tank onto a piece of dry ice. And, um, the dry ice is here and I should wear my goggles for doing this. I'm gonna get my goggles on. I'm gonna get my gloves on. Uh, thanks to the local hy uh, for allowing me to purchase that uh, dry ice. Anybody know what the temperature of dry ice is when it's in equilibrium with the uh, air? You can go ahead and type your answer and tell Aparna or you can speak it up. Speak up. I don't wanna hold this too long because it is really quite cold. <laughs> it is quite cold. I'm gonna go ahead and put this in our uh, container for our dry ice. Yeah. Okay. 
So did anybody uh, suggest what the temperature of dry ice is? No. No? Uh, it is minus 78 degrees Celsius. So minus, uh, sorry, minus zero. Zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water. Um, minus 40 degrees Celsius is equal to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So minus 78 degrees Celsius is going to be roughly minus um, 100 or so Fahrenheit. That's very cold. You wouldn't want to live in that environment. Um, <clears throat> but it's very convenient, uh, mostly because it's solid instead of a liquid. And uh, we're going to be using that to create a temperature inversion inside of our tank. Oh, thanks for the conversion. Thanks, Suda. So I feel very good. I just guessed roughly what that was, but. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we're going to create a temperature inversion inside the tank. So the, the, the bottom of the tank where the metal plate is, is going to be very cold. And the top of the plate, the top of the tank will be much warmer. So the alcohol will evaporate um, in the environment at the top of the tank. And then gravity will pull, uh, gravity will pull the, um, the vapor down. And as it goes down, the temperature goes down too. And so as it goes down, suddenly uh, what's called the vapor pressure uh, changes rapidly and the ability for the air to hold that vapor uh, in, in uh, vapor form um, is reduced. And so what happens is you get more vapor than should be allowed in that much colder air. It's waiting to condense and turn back into a liquid. Um, <clears throat> well, we have a surprise for it. So as it's waiting to turn back into a liquid at the bottom of the tank, we're gonna see that there are gonna be things flying through the tank from who knows where, which will suddenly cause the vapor to condense uh, in lines and other shapes. So I think I probably have talked enough and we're going to uh, go ahead and get started setting this up. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the camera around uh, so that we can see what we're doing. Okay, so first things first, I gotta get this thing out, which is always a pain. We get our isopropyl alcohol. Can you all see what I'm doing? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, Eric is asking, how cold is the co uh, cloud going to be? Uh, well, it'll be warmer than a, a minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit, but it'll be much colder than freezing. I don't know exactly how warm or how cold. A little bit difficult to. If, if this were a fancy experiment, I would have a little spray bottle and I would spray it, but I'm just going to pour it. Okay, we have saturated vapor inside there. And so now I'm going to go ahead and enclose it and tape it shut. Got black duct tape for effect. Again, I really don't want air to get in there so that it brings any moisture in. So we've got our enclosed environment. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put it on top of the dry ice. So flip it and put it on top of the dry ice. 
And the first thing you hear is it sounds like a screeching T-Rex. Um, and that, actually, let's get a bottle. not too bad. Okay, I was going to try and get a level, but I didn't see one. So, all right. Now, so we got to wait a little while for this to set up the environment so that it gets um, that separate saturated temperature. Now to visualize it, it's not easy to see, but we're going to we'll go ahead and turn this this way. <clears throat> to visualize, uh, to be able to see what's going to happen inside there, we need to have the bottom of the tank, that's where it's cold and that's where the interesting stuff is gonna happen. We need to have that bright compared to everything else. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn on, I've got a projector here. And starting to see a bit of uh, vapor. So let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to move my phone. Hopefully not hang up on you guys. Can you see inside the tank? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. So this is what we're going to do, and we're going to watch for that to uh, create an environment in which we can see the uh, uh, sort of surprise visitors from another world, even another uh, galaxy uh, that come and visit us. But it's going to take just a bit to set up that temperature gradient. And I need it to focus, don't I? And okay. So that's gonna take a little bit of time. So I'm going to... Um, can I ask some questions? Yeah, of course. Uh, Eric Araja is asking, what will happen if you touch the dry ice with your skin? Uh, it will almost instantly freeze and stick to the dry ice. Okay. And Dr. Malur is asking, is it fogging outside? Outside the uh, container, you mean outside the tank? I think so. No. No, it's not. In general, it's not foggy. Well, a little bit it's foggy outside, yes. Oh, I think I saw my first. So right, <clears throat> right now, Eli, uh, what's happening is you're getting um, the, f the vapor is settling in. We're getting kind of an equilibrium, a dynamic equilibrium as the, the vapor falls, it cools. It uh, creates an environment in which it's super saturated. It's ready to condense. And then we're looking for So we're looking for eventually up oh, there. 
So now you got to keep your eyes peeled. We're already starting to see some tracks, some trails inside the vapor. So I can't see it so well from my phone because I can't pin the image on the phone. Why is that true? No, can't do that. All right, so I'm just gonna look from here and hopefully I'll draw your attention. So what we're looking for are trails of vapor where up, oh, like suddenly on the right-hand side there. Uh, well, I don't know what side that would be for you guys. Yeah, to the right in your image. Um, we're looking for trails of vapor something like what you would see coming out of an airplane when it's flying through the clear sky. And you'll see, uh, uh, they're called contrails, right? So as the jet exhaust comes out of the jet, then it interacts with the environment and it, um, because it changes the temperature so rapidly, then you get condensation around those um, trails. The same is gonna be happening here, where you're gonna have this, um, highly uh, saturated environment where this vapor of isopropyl alcohol is waiting to condense around something. And one thing that will cause it to condense are charged particles, electric charges. And something is going to be, oh, there was one that just crossed uh, right through the middle there. Uh, there are gonna be things, there's another one. So we're, we're get, we've got our environment set up pretty well already. Um, <clears throat> something is going through that environment and leaving behind it a trail of charged particles. And that trail of charged particles, these ionized molecules of gas are uh, condensation centers for the, uh, for the supersaturated vapor. And so the vapor serves as a way of tracking the passage of charged particles, but not just charged particles, very high energy particles like that one. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and to visualize these things, and of course we couldn't see otherwise. Yeah, Eric, go ahead. What, what, do you, what is your question? Um, uh, there's been a lot of them and um... Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, can you not hear me? Yeah, just to speak louder. Can you hear us? Hello. Yep. Okay. Just kidding. Anyways, um, there's been a lot of uh, cloud things that we've realized and, um, and the little lines. There's been a few that have been like humongous that just went across the whole thing. Like that. Right. And there's been some tiny ones that just went like that. Right. There are some that are very short trails, and then there are some trails that are very long. It might be because some of the particles are moving, you know, from above down below, so they're not going straight across. Some particles are going straight across. Also, some particles could be going through, but not have very high energy, and so they stop. They get, uh, they give up energy and stop. But you're able to see them, right, Eric? Yeah? Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, that's awesome. It happened very quickly. So uh, <clears throat> there's a huge variety of different particles that are going through there, it turns out. Um, probably the, one of the most prevalent kind of particle is called a muon. No, it doesn't matter whether you're outside or inside. Uh, Dr. Babu asked, does it matter if you take it outside? It doesn't. Uh, you're able to see particles inside. Um, yeah. These particles have so much energy in them that uh, it, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're in the way or walls of a building are in the way, unless you're surrounded by lead, um, you're probably gonna see a lot of trails regardless. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the, one of the main particles that you're seeing is something called a muon. A muon 
is not a normal particle. It's not a part of our everyday world. So the, the particles that are a part of our everyday world that, we, that are charged, that we could see, are protons and electrons, right? And protons and electrons make up atoms. So we know of, for instance, hydrogen atom is one proton surrounded by a single electron. And then helium has two protons plus two neutrons at its center, its nucleus, surrounded by two electrons. So ordinary matter is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons, all the elements that we are made up of. <clears throat> but muons are like the big cousins of electrons. Their um, electrons are very light, uh, low mass. Muons are much more massive, not as massive as a proton, but almost. And they are unstable. They, we don't see them in our ordinary world because they fall apart almost immediately. So where do they come from? Anybody have any ideas? Where, how, why is it that we can be seeing muons in this tank, these tracks, these straight uh, tracks that are obviously high energy particles that are charged going through the tank? Where would we, where would we see particles like that coming from? if they decay. Right, so Dr. Babu knows the answer to that one. <laughs> no fair, Dr. Babu. <laughs> um, that's right, they're, they're, they are the product of cosmic radiation interacting with our upper atmosphere. So it turns out our, our atmosphere does a lot of good things for us. <laughs> one, we can breathe, that's great. Uh, two, um, it may be as important, it protects us from extremely high energy particles that are traveling from everywhere in the known universe and interacting with the earth. Uh, <clears throat> they could be protons, electrons, or any other number of particles. And so when they interact with our upper atmosphere, they create something called a, a cosmic shower or an air shower of particles. There's a lot of physics involved in that because you've got one particle, not meteors, that's right, and <laughs> not meteors. Um, <clears throat> they're not big particles. They are extremely small particles. So one way to think about how small they are, right, is so muons are bigger than electrons, but smaller than protons. So hydrogen, Make, is made up of one electron, one proton. To have, um, uh, let's see, what's called Avogadro's number, six times 10 to the 23rd particles, represents uh, gas in 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure. So there would be six times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms in a 22.4 liter container. Six times 10 to the 23rd is an unbelievably big number. Um, so one of these guys is super, super small. A meteor would be made up of 10 to the 30th or 10 to the 33rd number of atoms of different kinds of materials. So this is just one of those particles. The fact that we can see them at all is amazing. There've been quite a few tracks going through, right? Okay, um, so what are, I mentioned muons. Let's go to, I'm gonna go to my other computer and show you some of the other particles that might be coming up. There are many tracks, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Some are just like squiggly, very short. Some are straight. Some actually are straight and then suddenly change direction which is uh, an illustration of either a collision or even a possibly a decay, a muon decays under, beneath our very noses. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the particles that might be coming our way from the cosmic radiation. Uh, 
Dr. Babu is saying now there are many tracks visible. And uh, yeah, and he's asking question, do you have a small magnet that you can bring near the chamber? I do. Who's, who's asking that? Dr. Babu. I, I have a magnet, but not a small one. Just a moment. Okay, and Atharva is asking another question. They all seem to be traveling to a specific point. Uh, <clears throat> I think mostly that's an illusion because the, the light source is, um, is not spread out over the entire chamber. So uh, in general, you're gonna be seeing tracks that are going like this along the direction that's clearly illuminated. So Dr. Babu asked about a magnet. So I'm gonna bring it to the computer so you can see the magnet that I have. So this is my small magnet. It's six inches in diameter. It's made up of uh, neodymium iron boride, which is a very strongly magnetic material, which is also able to hold on to its magnetism. It's a ceramic material, so it's actually covered with nickel. Um, I believe it's the coating, I forgot, but I think that's right. This is a very strong magnet, so I can illustrate the nature of the magnetic field. So the, the trick here is I'm, I, I can't get too close to my computer. This magnet will not be friends with my computer very much, but um, I want to show you using this device, which is a little magnetic probe, something about the nature of the magnetic field. I, I hope you can see it as I move around the magnet. I guess if I go this way, do you see that it, probe follows, I don't know how well you can see this. I notice that the probe lines up in this direction. And then as I go around the side of the magnet, the probe flips direction. That tells me that the magnetic field is pointing. Dr. Abchak, we cannot see you on the screens. Oh, you're not seeing me well? Because I'm on my, my big computer. So you can, uh, shoot. All right, I'll switch. I, th I think you have to unmute yourself from that computer to, uh, in order to see yourself in there. Okay, so what I'm gonna, oh, jeez. <laughs> can you hold it? Yeah, yeah, so, what I just hold. so Jesse's gonna hold it for me. So this is the magnet. Ah. All right, so you can all see the magnet. So then I'm going to take my probe and notice that it's lined up perpendicular. So there's a magnetic field coming out this way. As I go to the side of the magnet, the magnetic field rotates. And in the bottom, the magnetic field is pointing in the opposite direction. You want to do a close up of that so they can see what that is. Yeah. And then here's my magnetic probe. Yes, yes. So there's a blue side and a red side. Mm -hmm. At the top, the blue side is pointing to the magnet. At the bottom, the red side is pointing to the magnet. Okay, so it's a very strong magnet and it's producing a magnetic field coming this way. Okay. So, so we're now going to take this magnet and put it underneath the chamber. And we're gonna have to adjust our, um, <coughs> Adjust our <laughs> adjust the level of our um, projector here. I'm going to set this back down up here. When we adjust, uh, turn it around the other way because it's right. cleaner. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe not. The mag, uh, the, the, the camera's there. Yeah. All right. I'll adjust it.
Uh oh. Shoot, we got some vapor in there. We got some leaking. All right. Okay, now what you're gonna be looking for, uh, so what happened is some, when I moved the tank, I must have broken the seal and a little bit of air got in there with some water in the tank. But now we put the magnet underneath. The magnet is pointing up toward the camera. The magnetic field is pointing up toward the camera. Remember that most of the particles were traveling horizontal at the bottom of the plate. You're not seeing that. Anyway, <laughs> they're traveling horizontal at the bottom of the plate. When you have charged particles moving through a magnetic, a vertical magnetic field, they act very strangely. And you should be able to see some tracks that illustrate how that behaves once our environment gets it set up properly. So what you're gonna be looking for is instead of straight tracks, you're gonna be looking for tracks that follow a curve because it turns out that charged particles moving through a magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of the field tend to move in circles. So let me know when you see a particle that you think has been moving in at least a curved path. Sometimes you can see them actually moving in circles. I don't want to do the air thing again, that's Derek. <laughs> that hides the charged particles. Have you been able to see any curved tracks? Yes, they are saying yes. Okay. Actually, I saw the nodding uh, from Eric. <laughs> okay. And uh, were you able uh, to see them, Aparna? Yes. Okay. And everyone is loving what they are watching. Uh, Raiden says, uh, I agreed. And Dr. Malur and everyone, Atharva, you know, everyone is like, Loving it. So thank okay, you. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I'm going to show you a short video. Um, I can't see. I, I haven't been able to see too many things because I've been doing other stuff, but um, that's great. So you can see it. It's nice to make a recording of the, the tracks because sometimes you miss them. You're looking all over the place. You don't know where to look. So it's nice to take a make a recording of them using your phone. 
and then you can look back at the recording and see um, uh, look back at the recording and then you can follow some of the tracks you can kind of play it through slowly to make sure you see what's happening so I'm going to show you a recording in just a bit with my computer Okay, so I'm going to take a break away from this one and go ahead and show you the recording so that we'll all be looking at the same thing and I can slow it down and replay it. So uh, I need to mute. Okay, so can I, uh, can you guys all hear me now from this computer? Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I've got a video, I, share, I uploaded it to Facebook. And um, this is from a while ago, again with a magnet. So, oh, I got to go back there. Okay, so here's uh, same setup, same tank and everything with a magnet underneath it. And I'm recording uh, <clears throat> the video and I'm going to try to stop it when we see some tracks that are going in curved paths. It might be hard to see. Uh, let's see if I can back up a little bit. There was a circle yeah. right there. Which I think is pretty unusual because my magnet has a strength less than a Tesla. Um, <clears throat> cancel. Okay, so right about. So right. Here, you should have seen a, almost a complete circle of a particle track at mm -hmm. that point. So yes, yes. I think it's unusual that I was able to see that because um, in general, it had, the particle had to have just the right energy so that the radius of the circle was the size of the tank. Okay, um, so let's, um, now that I'm at the computer, let's take a look at a few things to kind of have a sense of what it is we're looking at. So I'm going to go ahead and share my other screen. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, a lot of the radiation that we're seeing is radiation that's coming not from the earth, but rather from outer space. And really, who knows from where? Somewhere, most likely from maybe the center of our galaxy, but also from other galaxies. Uh, the center of our galaxy is, uh, Dr. Araya, how far is the, the center of our galaxy away from us? 26,000 years away. 26,000 light years away from us. So something that's traveling at nearly the speed of light would take 26,000 years or more to get to us. <clears throat> and that's amazing that in, the, in doing that, it's able to keep all that energy. So to keep moving at nearly the speed of light that whole time. So as the, this particle comes in and collides with our upper atmosphere, <clears throat> many particles are created. Now that's amazing. How does one particle become many particles? Anybody have a, uh, an answer to Dr. Babu? You can't answer. <laughs> 
Anybody know how that's possible that one particle can become many particles? Yeah, Eric. Uh, I may, uh, well, I guess it could like divide. Um, and it might like grow like the little pieces of the particle might uh, grow into other particles and it might split again to make even bigger ones. So you think like it's breaking apart? Yeah. That's an interesting idea. It would make sense, right? It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It turns out that some of the particles that come out are bigger than the ones that you started with. Certainly um, uh, protons, neutrons uh, are as big at least as the, the proton that was coming in, for example. It's amazing. It's not breaking apart into smaller and smaller things like shattering. Instead, many, many particles. So the mass of the particles that are coming out is much greater than the mass of the incoming particle. But there's a, a kind of a magical thing that's happening that allows that to take place. And that is uh, Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. So those aren't just letters. E is energy. So energy like something moving very fast has a lot of energy. But it turns out that according to Einstein's equation, E can become mass, M. E is equivalent to mass times C, which is the speed of light squared. So if an object has a lot of energy, like these cosmic rays do, when they collide with our atmosphere, some of that energy, a lot of that energy can be converted into mass and it can create new particles. It has to obey certain rules. It can't just create anything. So for example, when the proton collides with the upper atmosphere, it can't create an elephant or a crocodile or a mushroom, but it can create other kinds of particles uh, as long as certain things are conserved. So it can create protons and so on. And then you get the shower of particles. It's literally a shower of many thousands of particles that uh, fall down to the earth. And a lot of them, we talked about um, this symbol here, uh, mu, the Greek letter mu, which is a symbol for a muon. So quite a few of them are muons, not a lot, but enough. Uh, so according to this diagram, at least it says 1.7%. Um, quite a few of the particles are electrons, high energy electrons. You also get something called gamma rays, which are photons, which can also then become charged particles as they interact. Um, <clears throat> and you get a few protons and neutrons. So the, um, those muons that we're seeing, the, uh, the cousins of electrons, the bigger cousins of electrons, are the result of one of the results of these really energetic collisions where all the energy, boy, my chamber is doing something here, uh, where all the energy uh, of those cosmic rays is getting converted into all different kinds of particles. Uh, now the muon is a special one because the muon, like I said, it's much bigger than the electron. It's also not stable. So there's another mystery associated with the muon, which is that the half-life of a muon, so the, the expected time it takes for half of the muons that are created to then fall apart, to, de to decay, is two times 10 to the minus six seconds. And the time, the time that it takes for muons to make it from the upper atmosphere, 35 kilometers away, down to the level of the where we are nearly sea level is much longer than two times 10 to the minus six um, seconds, even though they're moving very fast. So the question is how do they make it? They should have all decayed by the time they come, uh, by the time 
uh, they would be able to travel this far. They should have turned into something else, but we can still see a lot of muons. So Einstein also comes into play here. So uh, Einstein uh, in his theory of relativity tells us that, uh, or demonstrates for us that when things are moving very fast, time moves differently for them than it does for us. So if we were moving along with a muon, we would say, yeah, it, on average, they, one of them decayed, uh, the half of them decayed in two times 10 to the minus six seconds. But <clears throat> we see that same time interval as much longer. And that means they have enough time to make it all the way down to the surface of the earth. So it's another kind of uh, unusual aspect of the way the natural world works, which is very different than the way we're used to when things have, are moving at very high speeds and with very high energy. Uh, there you go, Eric, you had a nice little uh, blast of air <laughs> coming into the tank. <clears throat> so you get this huge cascade of particles. Now I wanted to show you, um, so this one is just something I made and uh, it works very well. I wish I had a better light source. I wish I had um, a bigger tank. So uh, my wish is going to be granted. So I'm gonna switch here and we're gonna take a look at a video of a very, very sophisticated cloud chamber and all the different kinds of tracks that can be seen. So let's uh, go ahead and play this. I'm gonna go ahead and expand it. Can you all see the video? So I, I, I asked the makers of this if they speeded up their recording. Um, and I'm guessing that they did because they've got, they're seeing a lot of tracks. Can you believe that there are so many things traveling through the surrounding space at very high energies all around us, right through us, through our buildings? The big fat things, those big fat trails, those are uh, produced by something called alpha particles. That's not cosmic radiation. That's something that's, there's a radioactive decay taking place inside the chamber. The long straight trails, those are those very high energy muons or electrons. Then you have some squiggly trails. Those might be from electrons which are released from um, photoelectric electrons, you know, released by light, um, uh, or they might be uh, electrons released by radioactive decay. Imagine all those things are going through your brain right now. <laughs> how, can we keep, how can we keep our thoughts straight when all these things are flying through our heads? <laughs> Now this stuff is, um, it's can ionize, right? So uh, what does ionization mean? It means it's uh, stripping electrons off of the atoms that make are in that chamber. Uh, they can also strip electrons off of cell uh, molecules that are inside of us. Um, and of course, that's why radiation can be dangerous because <clears throat> it can disrupt uh, the molecules inside of our cells. And if it happens to hit the wrong molecules and the wrong cells, that can have a lasting impact on us or on our future generations. So I'd love to be able to make a cloud chamber like this one. Actually, they sell them. I don't know if you can see, but there's like a light, there's a nice even light source all the way around the tank. Mm -hmm. um, so it just makes it uh, very, very clear. Dr. Rapchak, what vapor do they use in this commercial? Universe? I think it's the same thing. I think it's isopropyl alcohol, but I don't know. I didn't look. It's, I think it's dry ice. I think they have a dry ice container at the bottom. So I also wanted to show for, um, we can stop here. I think it's, you get the idea of the different kinds of tracks that you can see.
So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this. I wanted to show, uh, this is not, I, I looked up how to build this chamber on the web. Um, when I looked up, and I think I got it from CERN, which is the, um, the particle physics laboratory in Switzerland. Ah. I'm now gonna switch to a different screen, which is Adobe. So this document I got from CERN, it's a do-it-yourself cloud chamber manual. There's some directions that are a little bit different. As I mentioned, they go ahead and put their felt right at the top of the chamber instead of having the felt on the side. I like the design of the felt on the side. Um, there's some background information. Cloud chambers were really the first experimental technique that allowed us to just determine that there were particles other than electrons, protons, and neutrons, um, including it was the first detection of a positron, which is an anti-electron. Uh, so let me jump to the end here because it kind of gives you a menagerie of the kinds of tracks and particles that you might see. <clears throat> so again, a long, a thin straight track is a, typically a muon or anti-muon. Uh, even thinner would be electron or positron. Very fat one would be an alpha particle. An alpha particle is made up of two protons, two neutrons. So it's got much more charge and therefore it interacts much str more strongly with its environment and that's why it leaves a much fatter track. <clears throat> if you have curly curved tracks without a magnet, uh, that's typically electrons from some other, not from cosmic radiation. And then as I mentioned, it's possible, and uh, I've seen situations where you have a track going one direction, then all of a sudden it changes direction. And so you're seeing, you know, you're not seeing it in real time, you're seeing the aftermath, but you're seeing the evidence of the fact that these muons do decay, that they um, spontaneously break apart and turn into something else. More like Eric, what you were saying, where the particles do break apart, uh, that's uh, in decay, that's what's happening. So the muon will decay and turn into an electron <clears throat> and a neutrino. So um, this is a very nice resource from CERN. Uh, and uh, so you can build your own. But as I mentioned, I've, if you wanna to talk to an expert about how to build one, you can talk to me, no problem. Uh, let's go back to our chamber and see what's happening. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off. Excuse me. Okay, so is the, can you now, can you now see what's inside the chamber? Oh, I gotta stop sharing. The magnet is still underneath the, um, the chamber, so it still should be producing curved tracks. Dr. Rapter, do you have any radioactive samples? Oh, I do. Oh. Thank you. I think it's nice to re realize that you don't really need them to be able to see this cloud chamber working, but I do have a strontium. Now, Dr. Babu, maybe you can remind me. 
which side of the sample is the more active side? Oh, I don't know. Ask, you don't know? <laughs> ask right, we'll now. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and bring in a sample and I'm bringing it in for you guys who would be at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to bring it up close to the tank. Do you see a stream of tracks coming uh, from below, from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen? I do. Yes. Yes, I saw. Yeah. Excuse me. May I say something? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Suda. <coughs> uh, when we were talking about the, um, about the, what was it, how far the center of our galaxy was? A moment? Yes. I was, I was really surprised when you said that you were going and that at the speed of light that it would take you 6,000 years. 26,000 years. 26,000. Yeah, so we're not going to visit the center of the galaxy anytime soon. Unless we find somewhere fast. <laughs> We'd have to be going very fast. And even then, the fastest we could possibly go, we still wouldn't be able to get there. And I'm not sure we'd want to go there. What do you think, Dr. Araya? <clears throat> would we would we want to travel to the center of the galaxy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it should be quite beautiful. And, and moreover, as you mentioned, right, if you will move at the speed of close to the speed of light, we would be able to get there within a lifetime, right? And, and far less in a second if we move close enough. The problem, of course, it will have been 26,000 years for the rest of the people on Earth. Yeah. So we can we can make it there in uh, our life, uh, but not in the life of people staying on the planet. Oh, I didn't think of that. If that I thought if we were if you were taking a billion to the light, it would be like a. Uh, so, Dr. Babu, do you think the um, having the source there made more tracks? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it was obvious where they were coming from. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> it was visible. Okay. Good. good. Uh, before we. Uh, like you know go further everyone is liking um, liking what they are seeing and you know they are very happy uh, if you would like me to read some uh, comments yeah sure um Eli says it looks like constellations um and uh, otherwise there he you can see so many of them now right so um let me go uh, Ryan says particle collisions create new particles from the energy. Ah, uh, good. You got the right answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Raiden uh, says someone needs to make a compilation of the air entering the tank. Mm. And uh, Eric again says it looks like uh, X ray when the air gets in. Yes. So, yeah, it's very impressive, but it's not interesting scientifically. Okay, and then uh, Dr. Malur, uh, you know, she she's commenting. Everyone is commenting like Atharva. They are loving it. So Good. thank you. Good. So well, yeah. that's that's about that's about all I had to show you. If you want to keep on watching, this is like a fish tank. <laughs> the fish will always be doing something different and new. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, and you've been recording, is that right, Dr. Aparna? Uh, uh, yes. yes. Okay, good. Fantastic. Okay, well, if anybody else has any other questions or it's a little bit after 12 now, so. And they can mute uh, themselves and uh, ask question or uh, type yeah, in Yeah, so let me, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and change my microphone and move it back to the computer. It's easier for me to talk through mm -hmm. the computer. Okay. Okay. Anybody have any other uh, questions or comments? Or if you just want to sit in silent wonder at the invisible universe, that's okay too. Um, uh, I have a question. 
Okay. Um, me and Dad were just talking about uh, the speed of light and how if we could go in the future. I have a question about if you went one millise uh, one milliseconds, uh, um, but like one mile per hour less than the speed of light because if you're at the, at the speed of light, you have to burn yourself. You can't do matter. Um, uh, what would how far in the future would you go if you were one millisecond? Uh, at the speed of, or less, or the less than the speed of light. If you're just slightly less than the speed of light. Yeah. If you're just one millisecond is doing it for you. <clears throat> you know, I. I I can't do that calculation right <laughs> at the top of my head. I think that's a better question for your dad. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's not so much that you'll travel into the future, right? But that you'll be able to go, the process of you accelerating up to that speed and then decelerating back down, you will have aged much less than uh, somebody who stayed behind on the earth. And so you'll be able to go very far. And in a sense, you'll be able to travel into the future because you'll live longer relative to somebody who just stays at home. Yeah. Um, but I can't tell you how fast you have to go in order to make it worth your while to travel 26,000 light years and make it in time before you die. Yeah, there's a lot of complicated stuff. That, that's a long way to go. <laughs> I my dad like 15 times a bunch of questions. Um, and uh, I always can't, I always feel like I can't get a straight answer. Uh, I'm like, so can you uh, travel to the past? Uh, well, not really, but I mean, if dot, 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 blank, blank. Um, and I feel like I never get a straight answer, but. Uh, what kind so of straight I, answer do you want to get? I'm not sure, but I just need uh, like a straight answer. You uh, need a straight answer. <laughs> Um, I'm not, but uh, every time I ask a question about like time travel, or, like one of these speed of lights, I, I always feel like I don't get a straight answer or the answer has to be super, super confusing that nobody can understand. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. We just don't want you to know the secret <laughs> of how to travel. <laughs> we're, we're trying to keep a secret from you because we're scared of you. So we, we don't want to let you know. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nidhi Kapale from Germany. She says it looks cool. <clears throat> and Atharva Kapale has a question. He okay, says, what? You said that muons were big cousins of electrons. Yes. How are electrons able to stay in an environment the muons can't? <clears throat> because muons are not stable. So electrons are. And, and I, don't, I don't know the, the, the specific answer to it. Um, I would imagine, hmm, is this the weak nuclear force, Dr. Babu? Yes, it is. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> so um, the muons are just uh, not stable. They're not able to hold together, whereas the electrons are uh, stable in this environment. And I don't know what makes it so. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with that physics to give you a, a more detailed answer. But um, yeah, basically, and, and it has something to do with their mass. So it turns out, I know this much, that there are fundamental particles, uh, electrons um, and neutrinos. These are called, those are called leptons, which are, lepta is a very, is a Greek word for very, very small. <clears throat> and, um, and then there are it turns out there are three generations of leptons. So there's the electron, which is stable. And then above uh, the next generation above, the, the bigger cousin is the muon. And then even more massive than that is, is it called the tauon or just the tau particle? If you can recall. Yeah, it is there, the tau. Tau, right? Yeah. And so it's a more, even more massive particle and even more unstable. So it turns out the smallest of the three generations, which are observable, only the smallest one is stable and doesn't decay. 
it stays an electron forever. Um, there's a famous physicist who said, potentially, that maybe there's only one electron in the entire universe. And so this might answer your question, Eric. So uh, there might be only one electron in the universe and it travels back and forth in time to go everywhere. Because all electrons are identical in property. Um, and so maybe that's a possible explanation <laughs> for why they are is because it's the same one um, that's able to go back and forward in time. Dr. Rapchak, was it uh, Wheeler who said there is only one, there could be I just... I thought it was Feynman, but maybe he No, was... Feynman's uh, research supervisor, I think. Oh, know. okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I believe it is, yeah. Sure, sure. I'll uh, trust, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dr. Malur is asking, uh, she's saying, thanks for this video. I need your permission to use for my particle physics class. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I posted another video on Facebook, so. Okay. Once it's on Facebook, there's, I have no control. <laughs> okay. So you have permission, uh, Dr. Marur. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Eli is asking, what are the uses of, you? sorry, what are the uses for a cloud chamber? Uh, is it only used to see electrons? Well, <clears throat> it's used to see, um, charged particles. So as I said, uh, electrons were discovered prior to the cloud chamber. Um, but the cloud chamber was what um, uh, was developed and was the first thing that people, they realized that there was this radiation coming, these particles, high energy particles coming from outside our earth environment. Um, so they, uh, the cloud chamber was important for allowing us to discover that there is this cosmic radiation um, and to discover that there were these other kinds of particles, not just electrons and protons, but also positrons, which are anti-electrons and the muons and all these other kinds of particles. So it, it basically allowed us to see a part of the universe that we had no idea even existed until the 1930s. Okay. And nowadays, it's not, it's still used for some technology. I think some actual, you know, physical uh, physics experiments. But for the most part, um, you know, obviously what they do at CERN and uh, at the other and Fermilab while it was still operating, uh, those were using other um, means of detecting these particles using all kinds of sensors and so on. So this is a kind of a an old technology, but that's nice because it's easy to make relatively. The main thing you have to watch for is the dry ice is very cold and it will, you cannot touch it with your bare skin. You also have to make sure you're in an environment where the carbon dioxide doesn't accumulate. Um, <clears throat> and then you also have to watch it with the isopropyl alcohol. Um, but in general, it's a fairly safe substance. I mean, beauty shops use it, so. Um, Atharva is saying, okay, that helps. Uh, Dr. Malur is saying, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Eric is asking, may I, uh, may I say something? And I'm very glad that uh, our future, you know, the little kids, they are curious and they're asking uh, too many questions. So yeah, perfect. I'm very yeah, happy. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I feel like a little kid when I do this because it's just amazing. What you can see. Uh, Eli okay. says, okay, well, thank you for the video. I hope you have a great day. Thank, thank you, you so Eli. much. Thanks for watching, Eli. Uh, um, when I had a, um, uh, so there was a student, graduate student, not, none of you know him. Uh, his uh, nephew is now an engineering student up here at WIU, but he was, Dan Pratt was a graduate student in physics um, his brother, Dave, was the, one of the first students I had when I started teaching at Western. And his younger brother, Dan, was in the, um, went to the Navy. And then after he got out of the Navy, he came to WIU and got a graduate degree in physics. And when he helped me build my first 
Cloud Chamber, he said that was the most memorable experience of his graduate studies career. <laughs> and I, I agree with him. At, at the first time it worked, I couldn't believe it. And it's just amazing the things that you can see. So do we have more questions? Uh, I have my question still. Okay. Uh, my question was, have you made, uh, how can you make the dry ice? My dad kind of did an answer to it, but uh, he said that uh, you can't really make it. It's really difficult because you have to have something strong enough to keep the air, but it has to compress for the air to um uh start becoming a liquid and the whole process right and i think the chemistry doesn't the chemistry department have a dry ice maker i seem to recall them doing so yeah i mean you need to you need to be able to apply pressure and keep it contained and then and then lo lower the temperature I had, a, I had a funny uh i had a funny idea what if you had like a squishy like a squishy what? Squishy if you had a squishy hollowed out uh, and like pressed on it, would that like do it? Okay. Not enough pressure. Hmm. Or if you like sat on it or something. No, no, not even if your dad sat on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be a lot of pressure too. <laughs> uh, so how much pressure do you need to like make it? I, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm, and I'm not trying to deceive you either. I just don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, the air thing happened again. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> so cool how um, the air looks. It, kind, it does, really does look like a skeleton. It does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. like, a, like, a, like a nebula. An x-ray. If you got an x-ray and because the rest is black and then, oh, well, that would be a slide, like a trumpet or something. Yeah, it, it, yeah so, uh, yeah, and that's unfortunate. It must be that the tape is pulling away from the bottom of the tank, and so it's letting some air in. Because of the molecules that maybe, like, want to get out. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I think that's all I have to show for you guys. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Dr. Babu. He seems to know a lot. Um, or Dr. Arai. <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk. Uh, we can discuss. Uh, ah, Dr. Kapale just joined. <laughs> <laughs> you missed all the excitement, Dr. Kapale. So, Dr. Rapchak, how long will it stay in working condition, the one that you made? The... You no, know, I don't. Um, the dry ice will stay for a good. I, I got a, like three or four pounds, not a very big piece. It'll stay all day. Um, I've never let it run that long, so I don't know, but it's certainly you know lasted for a couple of hours without any problem. How hard do you need it to melt dry ice? And if you like... You know, the amazing thing about dry ice is that it doesn't melt. It turns directly from solid to gas. It's a weird, it's a weird substance that um, doesn't turn into a liquid. It just goes from gas to solid or from solid back to gas, at least at under room conditions, room pressure, temperature. Weird, uh, weird, uh, some, a weird substance like oobleck. Oh, I, I can't hear you. Uh, a weird substance like oobleck. Oh, like oobleck? <laughs> well, it, it different, but yeah, weird also. Actually, water is very weird also. Um, uh, I mean, water, unlike almost any other substance, right? Water is more dense as a liquid than it is as a solid. That's very strange too. Very good for us because um, then that means that ice rises. And so when water freezes, it doesn't freeze at the bottom, it freezes at the top. And so things can live in water that's um, even when the temperature is below freezing. 
Dr. Wong's ice uh, fishing, right, is possible because of that. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. I miss Dr. Wong's fish. <laughs> <clears throat> and going fishing with him. I didn't know that he ice fished, but that makes sense. I, I'm sure that I'm sure he's very good at it. Do we have more questions? No. So I want to, before we go, I want to say thanks again to Jesse over there. So he was very helpful, especially in helping to visualize what the magnet was doing and uh, helping set things up and bringing the. the radioactive sources, as well as the, the eye, uh, eyewear. Um, my own show. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and he will have his own show. He hasn't yet decided what amazing chemistry he's going to show us, but uh, he'll have his own show in April. So look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Do we have a schedule for what's coming up um, next month, Dr. Kapali? Uh, next month, it is going to be Dr. Araja uh, doing some astronomy related things. I don't know the details. And then after that, we have uh, Jesse, of course, showing us some chemistry. And then we are going to hear from, uh, uh, in May, uh, uh, economics professor Bill Pauly on something fun that he wants to show us. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm very thankful for uh, all of you to participate and continue this activity. It is a lot of fun. Uh, f it was a lot of fun for me to do it last uh, uh, semester and, you know, three or four sessions that I did. Um, uh, science communication in general is very interesting. I actually just was at the uh, APS leadership meeting and they had the session on uh, why science communication is so important. So uh, I missed this for another uh, equally nice and important topic. Right. No, it's good. I, I like to, to continue this effort. So thank you very much for doing it. And think about you know, some ideas that, uh, uh, that don't have to be as involved as this particular experiment, so to speak, but something simple uh, that we can use to, to get kids excited about science. That's the purpose. That's what's going to be sure. for all of us in the long run. So thank you again, Dr. Abchak, for doing it. I will be watching the video, so I won't miss it fully. Good. Yeah, and uh, you'll, it'll be available for everybody to look at, right? So we yes, just- yes. So yeah. I, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in the email that I sent everybody in the, fa uh, the faculty email, there is a permanent link for the WIU YouTube web, uh, okay. no, physics website. So it's uh, bit.ly slash WIU physics YouTube. So very easy to find. Okay. Uh, I will upload also this. Also in the poster as well. It is there on the poster as well. The latest version of the poster has that. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, very good. Thank you for doing this. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Thank yes. you for your questions. Okay. Thank you, yes. Dr. Rabchik. Uh, I would like to thank everyone, Jesse. Thank you, Dr. Rabchik, uh, and uh, all the faculty uh, like Dr. Babu, Dr. Malur, Dr. Araja and everyone to you know uh, see uh, share cool ideas with kids and with us so thank you so much it was very interesting and uh, even i learned so much so thank you sure and eric uh, hopefully we'll you'll get a straight answer one day okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you aparna for ho hosting it thank you <laughs> thank you Atharva Athar is saying thank you very much, Mr. Jesse and Dr. Rapchik for showing us this. Oh, thank you're you. more than welcome. Okay. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye.